Working Cows Podcast, Episode 187. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, here with another episode for you guys, powered by the Global Ag Network. And I am here today, excited for an episode with Justin Frichty and Jared Nock. They are launching uh, or have recently launched a new podcast called Roots and Ruminants. And we are going to talk to them today about the uh, why behind that title for their podcast and kind of their goal for the podcast. They are both... uh, guys that work with Millborn Seeds, so opportunity there for uh, some exposure to Millborn Seeds and what they do as well. So I'm excited about more agriculture podcasts, specifically more regenerative agriculture podcasts, specifically more regenerative agriculture podcasts that focus on uh, integrating livestock back onto crop ground and really excited to have a discussion with Justin and Jared today about that. So Justin, Jared, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. You bet. Glad to be here. This will be fun. So you guys have uh, recently launched a, a new podcast called Roots and Ruminants. Um, so I guess kind of I thought we'd use that as an outline for, for the show today. And uh, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with roots or do you want to start with ruminants? Uh, I think we'll start with roots. I think we'll start with roots. And, and those of uh, you who have followed the podcast or seen Millborn Seeds is obviously a, a large uh, regional and national actually distributor of cover crops alternative forages, native grass seeds, uh, cool introduced grasses, and pretty much anything else. So, but the roots, I think that, I guess I'll start with first is kind of where Justin and I are coming from, the perspectives that we have. Uh, I grew up by Willow Lake, South Dakota. That was the big town. Carpenter was the little town. Uh, Willow Lake's got about 200 people. It's where I went to high school. And I kind of explained that again just a little bit in the last uh, podcast, but, you know, I kind of explained that I grew up in a, uh, a dying town and going to a dying school and a dying church and a dying 4-H club on a farm that wasn't sure if it was going to be around for another 10 years. And uh, just kind of had this this mm. sense of just decay all around us. And I, I don't mean that to be negative. I really don't. Uh, the people that were left were survivors. They were uh, they were uh, really, you know, trying to, to get it out there and do the best they could. But just the 1980s and really the 1990s, which was just a hangover from the 80s farm crisis, uh, 20 years had just gotten area so down uh, that everybody was just wondering whether or not we could survive another year. And so you looked at your school and you said, well, you know, maybe if, if we can outlast Iroquois or Dolan, we'll get a few kids from there or Henry. And it was kind of developed in this survivor mentality. Um, and I, I don't want to start that off negative, but that's kind of how we grew up. So throwing out sows, milking 100 cows with my, my uncles, uh, having a few beef cows, just kind of scratching out a living in a very diversified uh, farm ranch operation and one that you know we really didn't at the time growing up think there might be much future at in fact that was kind of the marching orders from my parents was get out of here get a job uh you're not allowed back here right after college mm-hmm. so after five years I go to school to get a four-year degree uh with uh, no major changes and one month mi- and no minors so that was uh <laughs> you know kind of me stretching out <laughs> the, the good times as long as i could and to meet justin there uh, <laughs> I did a lot of the same things, lifestyle judging, niece judging, different different years, uh, and then pursuing a career after that. And then during that career, you know, just happened to work out that Justin and I get to work together on a lot of different projects projects now. So the the roots part of uh, roots of ruminants, I'd say for me is is understanding you know that background to to make family farms and ranches viable, uh, make them diverse, make them something that we're we're just conscious that we can be a part of a, you know, a viable future is just uh, something that I'm passionate about. So. Well, I'm just saying, I, you know, I mean, that's a pretty good segue We're opening into um, talking about our podcast is the roots of our foundation is kind of why we wanted to talk about or why we wanted to host this podcast. And our upbringings were really, really similar. Jerry talked about the diversity of his operation and the farm that he grew up on. It was real similar to the diversity of the operation that I grew up in. 
Um, I grew up northwest of Pipestone, about 15 miles, but we had sheep and we had stuck cows and corn and soybeans, small grain and forage operation. And uh, then, you know, dad later built a hog barn, uh, custom bean nursery uh, barn uh, to bring in some supplemental income to the farm as well. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think it's, it's a bit rare to have farms now that diverse. Um, but as we bring in people that we want to talk to on Roots and Ruins podcast, they have that diversity factor. Um, maybe it's not with multiple species or multiple crops on their operation. A lot of times it will be, but the diversity of how they're looking at things and how they're handling things on their farm and ranches, that's the mindset that we really appreciate and the mindset of, of how we want to be able to look at ranching and farming going forward for the future is this big wide scope of, of making sure that we're seeing everything with a, with a wide lens and keeping that diversity and, and so that we're staying profitable. And, you know, I mean, the deeper part of that is what Jared just mentioned is, golly, we really do care about the upper Midwest and the communities that we're a part of. And that, I mean, that means something to us and we want to raise families here. So that's, that's all really, really important. Yeah. Justin, could you kind of lay out for me what diversity looks like in your mind um, when you're talking about diversity in an operation? What are what are some of the uh, hallmarks or uh, defining characteristics of a of a diverse operation? Um, I think diversity means tying your systems together so that there isn't waste. And, Mm. you know, that 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 means stacking enterprises so that we have. um, uh, so right, we're utilizing the assets to the best of their abilities, right? If we're going to have, um, if, if we're going to have equipment, let's make sure that we're spreading that cost of the equipment over uh, crop and livestock operations and across different species lines. If if we do happen to run a, a feed wagon, well, let's make sure that we're not just feeding the stock cows with it one month out of the year. You know, how do we then maybe feed back on or maybe we have um, you know, another species, maybe we have some sheep that we're then going to, you know, cheap up a ration with and feed them with a feed wagon. I think it's all those things that, um, so I think it's diversifying um, within your operation to cut costs, you know, so that we're always making sure that this is a big, I mean, it's a holistic approach to ranching or a holistic approach to farming. But diversity is a big part of that because it's all got to fit into that same circle. I, I have uh, been saying since I started my podcast that we needed more agricultural podcasts. Um, if if I had my uh, preferences, my druthers, I would say we need more cow-focused regenerative agriculture podcasts if I could be so uh, niche, I guess, um, because I, there's – you know, the guys that are consuming this content, the guys and gals that are consuming this content uh, that I'm producing, that you guys are producing, have more time to consume content than I have to to produce enough content for them to consume. And so I, I posted a meme the other day. I'm a, I, I like memes. I like making memes. I like looking at memes. I posted a meme the other day and it's the, the Buzz and Woody meme from Toy Story. I've got four kids, so I tend to tend to gravitate towards those kind of memes. And it's the one where Buzz is saying, you know, whatever, whatever, everywhere. And I said, new podcasts, new podcasts everywhere. And so one of those new <laughs> podcasts, along with yours, you know, I, in the last two months, I think, uh, we've had Ranching Reboot with Brian Alexander from Kansas. We've had um, the Herd Quitter podcast with Jared Lumen from Minnesota, um, you know, and, and then you guys are coming online as well. And uh, all of them kind of fit that description of, of, you know, maybe you guys are a little bit more broad than just cow focused, but it is ruminant focused and, and regenerative, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, and I was listening to Brian Alexander's interview the other day uh, on the Ranching Reboot podcast, and, and he was talking to Mike Calicrate, and Mike was talking about right down to uh, composting um, hides from slaughtered animals, composting the, the guts from slaughtered animals, you know, and putting that back out on the field. So I, I think, you know, making those integrated uh, holes uh, in, and managing those as much as we can is is a, a huge thing. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, part of the reason there are so many new podcasts coming online uh, in these sectors is because there's demand for it. And I think part of the reason there's demand for it is because um, people have a desire to be in agriculture, but 
you know, as I heard Jared sp- share at the Young Farmers and Ranchers conference a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I think he said his his grandpa had had seen a one thousand x increase in land values from when he bought his land to to you know just in the recent past, and so that's kind of a a tough a tough hill to sled. Uh, getting started with that kind of an increase in land where we're not going to have that kind of an increase probably um, and and getting started there so uh, getting um, getting the soil as healthy as it can I think is is one one key to getting started in the climate that we're in right now and so if you would Jared uh, share a little bit about what uh, the root side of roots and ruminants looks like what are what are you trying to uh, accomplish what are you trying to manage for uh, when you start talking about uh, managing healthy soil and and healthy roots sure no <clears throat> great question i think that there's there was a fundamental shift when um, when they added the fifth tenant of soil health right when ray archuleta almost single-handedly got NRCS to basically announce there was a fifth tenant of soil health, not just the first four, but primarily deal more with the crop side of things. Uh, e- even though help you know native page land and, and improved pasture even accomplishes all four of the first tenants of soil health. And I want to make that very clear. But the incorporation of livestock as as something that needs to be done in every healthy system. And it is not in some healthy systems, or it's not if they're if they're just uh, you know feed focused. I think the reality is, is that in the state of South Dakota, really in the Midwest, we primarily produce livestock feed, livestock and livestock feed. We have some ethanol, we have some soybean oil, uh, we have some milling wheat and some sunflowers. Other, other than that, you know, predominantly most of our corn is going towards livestock, even after it's done the ethanol process. Most of soybean meal, uh, straw, hay. All feed. So our system is highly designed around feeding animals. And I think that the default position is to pen the animals and feed them there. I think there's a lot of creativity on ways to feed animals that don't involve the, the extra step of fossil fuel use. I think there's better ways to harvest that on the land. Anytime we can extend the grazing periods and grazing seasons, I think it's to, the, to everyone's benefit. Um, and everyone, I'd say, much broader than you know society, really, their benefit as well. So... I think that there's just an understanding that regardless of the commodities that we think we're producing, for the most part, the the revenue coming into our, even if just farmer only, the revenue coming into our operations is primarily supporting livestock. And, and your your episode, episode one with James Holes was really good in that regard uh, about um, a different way uh, to approach uh, getting those animals fed and and uh, just i mean the marketing the sourcing all of it was was out of the box i really enjoyed it you guys are are, are doing a, a great job with that and i, re- I really appreciate it I'm, gl- I'm glad to see uh more podcasts coming online um and that fifth principle that you're talking about adding uh livestock integration back into the land um is you know something that when when my travels with the Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee for Farm Bureau takes me east, I I see, you know, the the fields that don't have a fence around them, and I'm I'm like, well, the, there's obviously not livestock integration happening there. Uh, what are some of the what are some of the objections, Justin? As you understand it, what are some of the barriers uh, to livestock integration as you understand it? So like I said, I, I grew up in northwest Minnesota, northwest of Pipestone, and, and live there currently now. And so you, we travel across Minnesota for high school sports and everything. And you get out of the southwest corner, and it's a completely different world. I, I mean, I-90 drive east across Minnesota. There isn't a fence. No, there isn't a fence line on any of those fields. They're completely gone. They're all... I mean, they're all worked, obviously. A lot of them are still plowed when you go north of there. I mean, it's, it's a... So I guess it's, maybe the question to answer there is what happened there? Why did the livestock leave? Mm. And what how do we learn from that, I guess? Um, because, yeah, obviously, if we're going to make sure that these, these operations stay diverse, um, you know, I think it, it probably comes back to um, a bigger discussion of 
you know, profiting from raising livestock and the opportunities that it can bring financially. You know, I mean, right now we're, we're, we're turning again into different cycle as far as commodities and what they look like. And, you know, it, go ask somebody from South Central Minnesota who haven't had cattle for 25 years, but it's who, who is really excited about soil health. The likelihood of them getting cattle back in their operation now is probably pretty slim. Mm-hmm. And I guess the, the easiest mm-hmm. thing to do for them is to continue to farm with ease because of technology and equipment um, and less manual labor and if you have livestock you have more manual labor you have more time it's just it's just harder and it's not going to be as profitable (laughs) farming corn soybeans in the next year at least so it's not really a good sell um so i guess they had to comment that uh, how do you I always say I'm row crop illiterate, so you can you can tell me if I'm dumb or whatever. I I won't be offended, uh, but you know it seems to me that there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity there for some enterprising young agriculturalist uh, to say to go out there and offer to those guys. Hey, I'll put up the fence. I'll I'll work on the water infrastructure. Um, I'll bring the cattle, I'll, I'll source the cattle, I'll make sure that they're there when they should be and gone when they when they should be. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, all of these row crop, you know, you talk about the I states, all of these row crop areas in the world, uh, there is an opportunity there for somebody to, to provide, you know, kind of ecosystem services and and bring in the the ruminants to help the roots, you know, am, am, am I way off? Are people totally opposed to that idea? If somebody's willing to do the work, um, I don't know. You guys, you guys tell me what, what do you think? Is that, is that a viable option and, and, uh, business model? Well, I certainly love the idea of it. Absolutely love it. And I think that's probably a great entry point for somebody who wants to have livestock because there's a big, big resource that's not being utilized to its full advantage with the land there, you know, and, and, and certainly can bring some benefits to that landowner as far as so quality goes too. So um, are those people open to it? I, I would say there there is at least a portion that is open to it. And that's, you know, at least it's somebody. And I, I, I do believe that that's true. I really do. I also believe that there's a large portion that's not even open. And I'm not trying to be cynical or negative about it. It's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, there's there's definitely a sector out there that you know maybe their kids have no interest back in, in, in agriculture, even if it is just farming, and they want somebody to, to take care of you know their land and their legacy. Boy, that's a big opportunity for somebody who maybe doesn't have that in, in their life. Or else with it. And that really does exist. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's a good challenge you know, for both the young people and the you know, the farmers that have that resource and have it available to at least try to keep that going. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it's difficult to get in, right? So, you run a stocker operation in the I states, you know, the idea that you're going to be able to get, you know, capital for a couple hundred head to start with is, is difficult. So, it's most of these things we see smart, starting on small, small scale and then scaling as they get comfortable and successful at what they do. And there's really just not a good replacement of that. That's probably actually a better long-term strategy than saying, I'm going to go from never having seen a cow in this, or a steer or a calf on this property to go buying 500 head of stockers to put on, you know, corn stocks this fall without ever having taken care of one successfully first, right? So the problem is that we need a lot of small-scale innovation mm-hmm. to start with, and then it can be scaled once the knowledge and expertise is built up. Yeah. And, my, and like I said, I think my, my, my vision for that kind of a, a thing is more ecosystem services where I don't own the cows and I don't own the land. You know, I am, I am simply a middleman and the manager. Um, you know, if, if it yeah. grew enough, you could just be the middleman and then you would hire other managers. Um, you know, but I'm the middleman and the manager to start with, uh, where I'm, I'm finding people who need, uh, winter feed for their cattle, and I'm finding guys who've got corn stalks that I can turn these cattle out on, and then I'm showing up and I'm moving those cattle every day, uh, or or every three days, whatever it is. Um, and I guess is that 
model enough to answer the compaction question because when I've pitched that idea to uh, different um, different friends of mine who are row crop guys, which tends to be just guys on the YFNR committee, uh, that's the que- that's the response I get is the compaction issues. So if you're moving them every three days to a fresh set of corn stalks, you know, strip grazing away from water or whatever, is that enough to deal with compaction? Is that going to make compaction worse? Again, uh, confessing my row crop ignorance here, go ahead and, and, and fire away. But I, I, is that, would that work? You know, University of Nebraska has done quite a few studies over the years on this, on just showing that there's no negative impact on crop yield from, from corn stock grazing, especially when rotated. They will find that in really wet falls, right, when you get a lot of hugging and, and you can have some activity like that. Well, you know, in a system where the corn stocks are within a mile of your place, you, you can manage that. You can pull off, you can adjust, right, you store the feed supplies, that kind of thing. It makes it difficult if you're trying to operate 70 to 100 miles away or or something like that, or you're a long ways away from the corral. But that would be the only issues. Uh, I, I think that the dollars just have to be more attractive. I mean, the, even the eight to ten dollars, or eight ten to fifteen dollars an acre, you know, eight to fifteen, five to fifteen is kind of the range you hear about corn stocks being rented for. In five bushel, five dollar corn territory, that's two to three bushels. Um, in a year where row crop farmers have gotten twenty dollars an acre. For every acre of corn they had in, in different seed maps, right? <laughs> I mean, it's sad. I mean, the difference has to be appreciable, right? We've got to be hungry in order to change. Yeah, got to be hungry. Mm. And uh, the question is, is, are they hungry enough? It's, the science, I think, is is fairly well supportive of that. Uh, the the old knowledge of of what we think about soil compaction, the reason we're doing, you know, the level of tillage and stuff that we still are, is going to be hard to hard to change science is fairly supportive of that but yeah i'm not sure that there's going to be a, a hungriness to take it on well that's the thing you see there's just so much volatility that happens it, i mean it, it, i think that's probably the battle that needs to be won before we want to be corn stocks and grades is they just have to stop doing full tillage so whether that comes from research science some sort of funding program that doesn't you know that does pay them or does penalize them like should have penalized none of them uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I just, that's where all the word needs to start. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the hunger is going to come, or the hunger probably comes from the guy who wants to be an agriculturalist but can't afford $7,000 an acre land, you know. Yeah. Um, and that hunger comes from him, you know, cold calling, knocking on doors, you know, and saying, hey, uh, when you're done harvesting, will you leave those corn stalks there for me to bring some cows if I'm willing to do the fence and water infrastructure work. And, you know, I think that's where the hunger is going to come from. Uh, and, and if you, if you walk in there with a folder and some, some, you know, a presentation, uh, that's well put together and, and a proposal that says, these are the benefits as far as, uh, soil health, this is the manure and urine distribution and the difference it's going to make, you know, in, in the aggregation of your soil, I, you know, that's kind of where I'm, I'm thinking it's got to come from, from that side. Cause I agree with you, uh, corn, corn or corn, soybeans, Florida is an attractive rotation. I'm just, you know, I, I get that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We understand that too. And so we're not, we're saying that this is literally about the, the short term gain. It's not about the short term gain. It's about manifesting values, creating diverse pathways and systems and expressing ourselves in the way that, that we so see fit and can make it work. And it might not be the highest profit potential in the next three months, but it's a system that we won't have to change drastically if the outcome of plan A changes, right? So if corn goes back down to $3, we don't have to drastically change our game plan because we've got a robust system with multiple pathways. And, and yeah, exactly. That's, uh, yeah, that's right on. And, and Clay, yeah, you mentioned, you know, you it's really good of that person that is hungry and is willing to go after it, put some effort and time to do it. Um, you kind of add into that diverse mindset of that you know, young farmer or rancher that wants it bad enough. And that just, I mean, that's, that's exactly why, why we're here doing and talking about what we're talking about. I remember reading in Knowledge Rich Ranching by All Nation 20 years ago, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea for the first time where in South Dakota, Especially like East Central South Dakota probably has as high of annual pasture rent as anywhere in 
to North America for sure, right? So, mm. and the reason is because we're productive enough where we generally have grass all the time, and we don't have to invest on a periodic basis in uh, brush control, right? And we don't, we aren't constantly being invaded mm. by by woody species that are trying to take over, uh, which is why pasture in the south and east, even though making more rain is more expensive because it has more maintenance costs, okay? So the idea that we have this in the reading and knowledge is ranching about guys down in Mississippi getting paid, not paying, getting paid to graze down the vegetation on the on the dikes, berms, and things like that. And it's like, yeah, you, you can get paid to graze. Um, you know, we know an example of, a, of a, mm. uh, a group in Minnesota that gets paid to run sheep on solar farms, right, yeah. to keep vegetation down. So they're getting paid to graze, not paying to graze. I think that's where, ultimately, if the incentive structure was there, and if we fully understood the societal benefits of everything of grazing and the the ground agronomic benefits of grazing corn stalks with cows instead of doing tillage to manage residue, we would be paid to graze. But we're not there today. We're still paying to graze. We're not paying a lot, but we're paying to graze. Somebody calls you up, offers you grant. I was going to pay you $25 a head to bring them home. Oh, fine. Yeah, sure. I could bring them for a few months. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Who's the best audience for this conversation? Is it is it college students um, who want to be involved? Uh, who would you think are the people who, who need to be uh, made aware of the opportunity if somebody was hungry enough to pursue it? I think this is a great opportunity for someone to do in their hometown with the resources allowed. I think you'd have an uphill battle. You'd probably be kind of re- uh, viewed as one of the, uh, the door-to-door uh, uh, people to come by and want to paint your galvanized uh, <laughs> in your bins. You know what I mean? If, you, if you've got 300 miles away from home with a, with a folder and you're 22 years old and you have a pitch for somebody, you know, it's just how it's going to be received. So, But I think it's great uh, if you have the ability to have some and you don't have to do it in your hometown, but get somewhere and plant and get to where people trust you. Um, don't be discouraged if you go knock on doors where no one knows who you are and has never heard of you before. And they say no to this. That's pretty common nature, right? I, I probably wouldn't, you know, allow someone to come babysit if they, like, I'd never heard of them before. And they're knocking on my door and they want to, like, watch my house for me. You know, I'm probably not going to allow someone like that to run, watch down and deal with my property either. So, in, in a place where you can build up or have those those connections, I think it's a it's a great opportunity. I, I think what has happened is yep. uh, this is less as you go to the east, but in a large sections of, of uh, the areas, I think that there, if your farming operation wasn't of a certain size, um, you didn't come back because you know it wasn't full time. In reality, this this hybrid of, of Extra income, as well as being able to grow and maintain maybe a less than full time existence on a farm or ranch now, is a is a pathway that's been in common and probably going to be become more common in the future. So this would be it doesn't always have to be employment, and that's where we messed up. We thought it had to be a job. It doesn't have to be a job. It just has to be a supplemental source of income. And that can definitely be running your own business. Yeah, and this is something you know. I've considered like I've got a son who's 12 years old and right now uh, I'm still trying to talk my wife into letting him live in a camper on my dad's irrigated uh, farm ground <laughs> when, when he's like yeah. 15, 16 years old during the summers. Cause I mean, there's an opportunity there. You could go and get, get some experience grazing animals uh, on some irrigated ground. And, you know, I think it's something that given, given the nature of the tools for, uh, grazing right now, um, you know, a 15, 16 year old kid could, could build the, could build the fence, you know, by himself, start out, you know, with some fiberglass rods and and some high tensile wire and he could do the work. And, uh, so I, I think that there's opportunity even before graduation from high school to, uh, in the summer to get some of this, these experiences and, and build up some of those skills and, and then maybe, uh, Use use that as an opportunity to facilitate the growth of a of a business like that. What else? Uh, what are what are some of your other goals uh, with the Roots and Ruminants podcast? Uh, tell me about some of the some of the upcoming guests or people that you guys are are looking to feature. So I think one of the other really cool things that we're going to touch on with uh, a lot of the different people that come on the show is is their different forage systems. 
Um, everybody needs to make feed for at least some portion of the year to feed their livestock. And, and it's get, getting those stories told of the unique ways that people are working them into crop rotations. Um, you know, I mean, God, there's just so many different variables and different options. But, you know, when it's working in a, a PO blend for baleage or silage or incorporating teff grass or maybe you get hail down on, on your corn crop and now we're going to broadcast a cover crop to graze. And, like, we've got the opportunity to hear all these stories and see the, the cool systems people have made and, and made them work for the soil, for the livestock, and made it work, you know, from a dollars and cents perspective. And so those are the stories we want told because that's that's what everybody's hungry for too, I think, is is they want to hear the real life stories. How did it really work for the guy? And, and can I just talk to him? Can I just hear his story? That's that's what we want to do, I guess. And that's and that's kind of what we've done. Our, you know, I mean, Jared and I have done a lot of that but within our own operations. And, and those are the ways you're trying to Usually you're trying to save money, you know, from buying less feed or incorporating the cheaper feed stuff. And so you start there and then you, you figure out that holy bucket. So maybe this actually does mean good things for my soil. And then you see that side of it and you become, you know, you, you dive into the soil health side and, and you see all those benefits and you get excited about that. And, and the return and it, just the good things that are coming from that, once again, that whole systems approach. Um, it's so yeah, we, we've got more of that coming, I guess, on the podcast. But yeah. that's what we're comfortable with, and yeah. what we like to talk about. Yeah, I think it's about, like I said, turning that survivor mentality into you know someone that you're something that you're proud of and, and building towards, and uh, creating resiliency. And, and the more we can share ideas and have other people on this podcast share ideas about that, the happier I'll be. Because I, I don't want, and I don't live in that, you know, description of the town that I described earlier. You know, I'll tell you, there's a lot of things that turn back around. We've got an entire few generation back. If we're talking about, you know, that that dying town of Willow Lake that I was I was growing up in, that dying school now has 50 percent more enrollment than it did 10 years ago. Right? So there's positive stories that are happening. It's primarily happening because of a large influx of young people, and with that has become a lot more livestock. Uh, and it's it's a little everything. It's cattle, sheep, and hogs, and dairy animals, and all of the above mm. um, in the area. That's what's been working. So it's there's a thousand ish species of plants that have you know seeds of a thousand species in the Melbourne warehouse, pretty much in any given time. It's just an unlimited amount of combinations of mixes, and you know, between native grass reseedings to cover crops to forages that can be put together. And we just want to help share some of those ideas and and think creatively on how to apply those. Yeah, not to mention the fact that Clark Willow Lake is a uh, perennial contender for the the wrestling team trophy. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're doing good yeah. things there with the yeah. wrestling yeah. team. So <laughs> a couple years back, and yeah, it's uh, they're doing they're doing well in a lot of ways. But it's it's a stark turnaround, and I think it was a little bit of attitude and ideology, and it was a lot of opportunities mm. that came from livestock. A lot of them. So. You know, you talked a little bit about uh, growing up in the in the mid '90s or so, and and kind of having that hangover from the '80s, and and seeing a lot of those um, kind of withering on the vine uh, operations in towns. And now you talk about kind of the turnaround that you're seeing there. Um, are they marketing those animals that came in? came back in uh, with the younger generations? Are they marketing them, them the same way they were marketed in the 80s? Or are they approaching the marketing of those animals differently uh, now uh, than they were back then? Uh, it's certainly the the hogs completely left. And then now they're coming back in, in confinement and contract form, which provides some good opportunities and provides at least, a, at least we're at a circular system of nutrient flow at that point, right? So yeah. the hogs are getting raised. And they're getting fed our corn and soybeans no matter what. Uh, the closer that we can have them, the more that we can cycle the nutrients back in the land, the better it is. And so uh, there's that's the one thing I, we want to be careful of, that we're not taking any system down or you know belittling any system in agriculture. It's There's varying you know, degrees of what that looks like to be diverse, resilient, and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a big step. That's a real positive step that we now are actually feeding that feed close mm-hmm. to the home 
and recycle as much as back on our land, even though those are in a barn, right? So that has changed. Yeah. The hogs, like I said, the hogs much all after they were gone for a decade or two. Now they're coming back, right? So that's a positive thing. The dairy cattle, same way. We're the last people to milk cows in Southern Clark County in uh, independently in 2000, you know, dad and two uncles. And then we had one dairy move in about 10 years ago or so. And then now we have tens of thousands moving in, right? And so the feed resources, uh, the feed needs are changing, everything like that. The cow calf structure has intensified and they pretty much get marketed the same way. So, and the sheep numbers actually yep. up exponentially in the year um, as well. So the, the sheep, Cattle site segment has not probably changed appreciably on how they've marketed their products, who they sell to, who ends up feeding them, how they get to the consumer. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the the dairy is, you know, spent 20 years absent from the area, now is back and is pretty much in a consolidated form. And the hogs, uh, you know, the hog industry isn't changing, it changed. And, you know, you can still get multiple options for, uh, for barn spaces in most times. So, you can build a barn and you can kind of pick who your partner is. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot more further consolidation than where they're at now. So I think you still have some options on people to work with in the future. So I guess that's maybe a long answer, but that's explaining the state of what most livestock looks like. I was just saying, like, on the, on the cattle side of it, if we look at how people are raising them, it definitely has intensified in terms of management and care. Yeah. That, that sort of thing. But in terms of how they are marketed, yeah, maybe people still take them to the same sale barn or, or, or go to the same buying group. But if you look at how they're being marketed and sold to the consumer, I think that's where we've seen the biggest change in the last 10 years. You know, I mean, we didn't have CAB, we didn't have certified herbal beef, we didn't have grass mm. fed, we didn't have organic, we didn't have NHTC calves, like all these different yep. programs that are now built in to what the consumer is actually demanding. Is driving how we're doing it, and and so I think that I mean, once again it's another opportunity for us. Pick your pick your favorite program and work it and go for it and try to make the best. But that's that's probably um, and I think I guess looking towards the future and how we're raising beef and how we're operating within our calf operations, it's it's probably going to be more of that, and it's probably going to consolidate and get even tighter into those groups where. All right, and I'm I'm tied into a five year contract now with a, a a buying group that wants them raised this way. Or, you know, I mean, maybe it's just not how they're treated. Maybe it's all natural not antibiotics. This is my buying group, and I can see that you know fifty other producers that are doing it. And now we are marketing our product together to have you know, more selling power. I I see that that's how the consumer wants to purchase, and we're probably going to have to produce it mm-hmm. that way for them. It's good to have that feed, feedback loop. Um, Jared, you talked about um, nutrient cycling, um, and I'm, I'm hesitant to mention the name because I, st- I still can't believe, um, you know, I believe what he said. I just can't believe that I understood him correctly. <laughs> and we were I was on a farm tour in eastern South Dakota, and uh, we were touring a, a concentrated animal feeding operation, and I was talking to the dad in this scenario, and he, he told me about the difference uh, applying applying the manure you know from from the um, from the CAFO back out on their fields has made and basically it pays his son's salary for the year what they save in uh, you know chemical fertilizer and and those kinds of costs every year is paying his son's salary to to basically uh, be the the labor side of the feedlot and the farming operation. So, I mean, it's just pretty incredible when you start to think about what you can, what you can accomplish through nutrient cycling. Yeah, no, I, that's, that they, they must be getting a little bit better rates on the manure application than we are. (laughs) Manure manure application can be put a high expense when you factor that in there. Um, Mm. Really everything where it's in the machines, if you hire a gun, you realize that it's, it's quite expensive and it's, but it's really important that you don't have those nutrients leave. So was working with a guy and we were talking about some, some challenges he's having on his soils and he likely, you know, we talked about, I, we already did some testing, but he's likely just phosphorus deficient and he's trying to, you know, kind of cover crop his way out of a phosphorus deficiency. And there's just no way to do that, right? It's if, if you used your soil uh, taking forage off or grain off or whatever it was, and you got yourself in a phosphorus deficiency, you just, you just don't have a choice but to go to a mine and get phosphorus and put it in your soil. 
So that nutrient cycling is really important so that you don't have to continually go back to the to the well, to the few places that have phosphorus flows in the United States and continue to buy them. I guess um, I got a couple of questions here that came in uh, from from my private Facebook group that I wanted to play uh, for you guys to answer. But before we get to that, I'll, I'll get my own question answered. Uh, how do you guys approach um, seeds and and planting in a range scenario? Uh, you know, I'm I'm in some very heavy clay soils uh, where I'm at, um, predominantly dominated by uh, crested wheat. Is there is it just graze it until it improves? Is there a good way to uh, is there a good way to um, go about uh, preparing that 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 land to receive seed? Uh, how would you guys approach that scenario? Well, I think the easiest and the cheapest is through management, and I actually believe that most um, native range land, or even if it's not still native, but ranch land that was restored will still get to the point you want it to through really good management. But I believe that you can speed that up by doing some interseeding things. And usually we see the best results when we're interseeding um, a diversity of species that offsets what's there. So we're learning really um, uh, a ratio of lots of grasses with very little brownies and legumes on the land, it's always easier to establish legumes in amongst them. And overseeding legumes that are or brownies or forbs that are naturally shade tolerant and, and can live with the competitiveness of the grasses out there, they take hold and do well. So um, I guess, you know, start to finish how we go about it is making sure that we're putting suitable forbs and legumes out there for your soils and your area and your climate. Um, if it's going back on native rangeland, then we'll use you know, good forage quality like you for prairie clover and, and, and lead plant, um, things that cattle still like a lot. And then we'd probably go out there. In most cases, we'd actually broadcast it because it is just in, in most areas, it's so hard to go out there with a no till drill and overseed. So then we'd probably do frost seedings and, and either do that as a dormant seeding in December time or in, in March, to try to catch that freeze thaw cycle with some snow coming out of the field. Um, so that's kind of how I go about it. Try through management, uh, but if it's a long road, uphill battle that we want to speed up, then we do some interceptions with some suitable, suitable species out there. I appreciate that. So first question comes from a, a dairy producer out of Manitoba, Canada. Hi, Clay. This is Sean Smith from Manitoba Calling. I had a question for Justin uh, in your next interview. I was just curious if he has ever um, planted multi-species crops for animal feed. Um, I've been thinking about doing this on our dairy, and I was just wondering if he had any experience on it, thinking something like barley, peas, and maybe flax and something else, toss into it, combine it, and uh, put it all through a hammer mill and use it as animal feed. Uh, if you could get that question to him, that'd be great. Thank you. I, I just gotta let Justin play on this too, but I, the biggest challenge of trying to harvest, like grain harvest, multiple species at one time, is because they just many times don't re- achieve maturity. Uh, so you'll you'll get the barley, you know, over mature where it's starting to shell out, and the peas still green yet, and the flax not where it needs to be. Uh, tremendous luck with mixing species when it comes to making forage, right? Putting it into a bale, putting it into a windrow, putting it into a silo, uh, a pile. But when it comes to, you know, combining, hurts with success with a few things, but mostly it's like two species things that are kind of getting raised together. And I, I think that you're probably still going to have a little bit of loss when it comes to, you know, getting them just right, return to right now. Yeah, I guess that's what I've seen too. It's, 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 it is tricky, but it can be done. Um, you're either going to have shadow loss or you're going to have loss on the combine, though. Um, and I guess if your mindset is such that you're okay with some of that and you just want that diverse grain blend, um, it, it, it is doable. Uh, Jerry mentioned a few species and, and you did two clay that do work. Yeah. We've had decent luck with the zero grains because their maturity is fairly similar. And, and so like the pea, barley, triticale, oat, um, those, those have worked fairly good. Um, and they're all tall and we can get them all in the well, I guess if you laid it down on your own, you know, to think of that as doable with anything. But if you're a straight combine, you want them all the same height, too. But, um, but 
the seed size of those species are similar and the maturity is similar, and so we actually able to combine and take them for grain and, and have a, a pretty uniform bill of grain and combine them also. And the next one's up from a former guest of yours. This is Luke Perman, and we run a corn, soybean, and wheat rotation on our annual crop ground, but we would like to include a perennial uh, crop, something like a three to five year uh, duration in our rotation. I was curious what you might suggest, how that might look in that rotation, uh, when you would plant it, and just kind of some tips for managing uh, some perennials in a, in a shorter, shorter part of the rotation. Thanks. Well, if I was going to do a, a perennial that's going to last three to five years, I mean, I guess the thing that's going to be the most um, productive is probably going to be a blend of alfalfa and grasses. And I think that probably fits in the most, uh, I mean, it's, it's the broadest in terms of fitting everybody's goals you know, across a wide array of different operations. And so um, depending on where you are now, the grasses I would choose when we move west, we, we tend to use more wheat grasses. Intermediate tubes and wheatgrass work well with alfalfa and fit into a two cut system quite decent. And when we move east, we like orchard grass, uh, meadow fescue, tall horse fescue, uh, timothy. Those would be higher quality grasses that persist even better. And so, with higher amounts of rainfall as the alfalfa um, tends to regrow faster with higher, higher moisture on the growing seasons, those do too. And so, you know, in the three, four cut alfalfa system, those grasses can still work in conjunction with the alfalfa. I just, anytime that I can get a, a grass in alfalfa, I'm all for it. I think it feeds better than straight alfalfa. I think the longevity is better with those stands. And I think it's just, it's good from a diversity standpoint. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that, that always does for a five year rotation quite nicely, actually. And I would say that if, if you were looking at doing just grazing, it's pretty much the same species. Uh, you don't really have time to get the value out of a lot of those, you know, more traditional native warm season grasses that we that are iconic. Uh, just take too long to establish the more expensive to seed. You probably aren't worth it in a five-year, you know, duration. And the problem with putting an annual cover crop out five years in a row with the first cover crop mix is going to be weed control. Yeah. You know, it just... Uh, it's great to have a 10 species, 8 species mix out there for grazing, but you want to have some good weed control ahead of it, and then you're going to want to have something with it afterwards. So, you know, you could say, I, I like the idea of a five-year perennial. If you wanted to do three years, I maybe probably wouldn't go to a perennial. I would do that. I'd do a diverse cover crop mix, and then like a sedan grass, BMR sedan grass straight, so that you can put some broadleaf weed control the next year, and then year after that, try and go back to a diverse cover crop mix, graze those. Um, pretty, you know, standard, obviously three days, three days on 45 days rest, trying to rotate as much as you can. And, uh, yeah, I think that traditionally pasture has been one of our rotations and we haven't really thought about it in a few decades, maybe a generation, but a lot of fields in Iowa or Minnesota were the sow pastures, right? We're at 40 acres where you planted up to something and put sows up there or clover where the dry cows went, the dairy cows were. So it hasn't been all that many years where fields didn't get some sort of a, a perennial, you know, planted back to it for a period of time to try and, you know, be able to recover some soil structure, hold the ground together, uh, do some different things into the soil, build some organic matter back. And I think we've maybe talked about it in the, one of the podcasts here, but maybe that's a s- solution to, you know, 30 years of cropping, 15 years of, of perennial pasture for some of these marginal acres, if they're going to stay into crop production, it might be an ongoing refreshing uh, to try and, you know, keep things together. So. But as you said in your, your podcast with James Holtz, be careful because uh, perennials are a gateway drug, I think. Is that what, is that what you guys said? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah, you're going to start that. You're not going to be happy. You're going to look natives. You're going to see that first field of, you know, the seeding with big blue stem or Indian grass out there, and you're going to fall in love. <laughs> well, uh, Justin and Jared, I thank you guys for your time today. Where can people go to find more uh, about the Roots and Ruminants podcast? Yeah, you can see it in the Millbourne Seeds social media accounts, Twitter and Facebook. It should be up there. Otherwise, we're available on pretty much all the, the major venues, Apple, YouTube, Spotify. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Thanks, guys, for your time today. Thank, thank you. you. This is awesome. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. 
Very good stuff there with Justin and Jared. Really excited to see new podcasts getting off the ground. Um, really uh, looking forward to continued growth in this space and the opportunity for uh, people to continue that continuing education. I keep seeing uh, people posting on social media about how podcasts take those $10 an hour jobs that we find ourselves doing and uh, turn them into more profitable time spent with some of the best minds in the industry in their ears. Um, and that's not just agriculture, but all kinds of different things, you know, audio books and different things like that. And that commitment to lifelong learning. So, uh, as always really encourage you to check out workingcows.net slash resources. There'll be a link in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 187 to the workingcows.net slash resources page. So go ahead and check that out and click through some of those links and, and go down the rabbit hole of, uh, good resources to improve your management of the land, animals, people, and money that are entrusted to your care. We'll be back again real soon with another episode of the Working Cows Podcast. We'll see you then. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.